Good morning. Morning. This morning, I'm going to be talking about a subject that most of us it go through, we experience from time to night, time the feeling of being alone. But the title of the talk today is just the opposite. We are not alone. There is a lovely paragraph in the book Leaves of Moria's Garden, <clears throat> volume two, which is called actually Illumination, that I'm going to share and then discuss. The verse is going to help us understand that we as individuals, as groups, as nations, and as a humanity, we are not alone. Our actions do not go unnoticed by the master or by hierarchy. So here's the verse, and I'll read it slowly so you can really absorb it. And then throughout the talk this morning, I'll be taking different sentences from the verse and sharing uh, our understanding of it. And this is how it goes, and this is from paragraph 86. The Master says, learn to comprehend the manifestation of the teaching as a miracle. In order to manifest the shield on all paths of your life, he says, I feel each moment that is useful for you. Our front line stands as a wall and a smile flashes as lightning over all flashes at each of your successful moves. As a gardener sees the garden covered with buds, uprooting the reed weeds, so we watch the movements of the chosen hands. Joyous is each resourcefulness because the shield is forged on both sides. Broad is my work. To everyone a place is ordained. By the broadness of your vision will you allot your own part. The manifestation of unprecedented possibilities is behind the door. Give us reason to rejoice. And again, that's from paragraph 86, Leaves of Moria's Garden, Volume 2. So think about this, first of all, the hierarchy. The hierarchy is the living headquarters of a world educational group. It is formed by all teachers of all religions. They are very great ones. And what is perhaps comforting to some of us, is to realize that they started just like us, as human beings, and then developed stage by stage, growing, growing, broadening their consciousness, moving up into higher levels of consciousness. They mastered their lives, their personalities, their minds and bodies, and they became perfect on all planes. What may be a surprise to some of you is that most of them live in the world today. They have bodies just like us. Some of them have bodies that are composed etherically. Some can materialize their bodies and look just like we do. Some of them are working on the physical plane. Some of them are working on the mental plane and higher spheres. But all of them are closely connected and telepathically in contact with each other. And they watch everything going on in this world. The first two volumes of the Leaves of Moria's Garden were written for the original group of Agnew students. These people included Francis Grant, Cena Fosdick, Mary Segrist, Cena 
Paul said, well, I'm missing her twice here. I don't know how that happened. Anyway, <laughs> I have to put a little humor on this. <laughs> so let me start again. We have Francis Grant, Cena Fosick, Mary Seacrest, Catherine Stibby, the Rourke brothers, George and Svetislav, and Lewis and Nettie Horst, and of course there are a few others. The instructions in these two books were essentially for the original group of students. But, of course, the books were meant for everybody, for the whole. It was in 1920 that the teachings of Agni Yoga were in the process of being released to the world. Thirteen books were subsequently published after Helena Rourke recorded all the transmissions and placed them into what we now call the Agni Yoga series. The most recent of these publications is called Super Mundane. And Super Mundane was not published until the mid 1990s, although the first volume of Super Mundane was published in 1938. So these books are timely, and they are meant to be studied and applied to today's modern spiritual life and into this century. So let me take a look at verse, the first verse that I opened up with. Throughout the verse, we get a sense that we are not alone. Whatever you're doing, whatever I am doing, whatever the whole of humanity is doing, we are not alone. Great ones, Christ, Buddha, saints, angels, holy ones, God, they are very closely interested in what we do and also what we do not do. So this gives us a feeling that we are not abandoned. We just re must remember to remain in contact. It's like the poem that, that Richard was reading this morning, uh, which was a poem written by Torquem Saradarian in which he was expressing his gratitude to the Great Ones, to the Christ. This is why we have a meditation time, a prayer time every day before we start our day to remind us we are not alone and to express our gratitude to these Great Ones for their sacrificial lives, their service, and for staying with us on this planet. So this hopefully will give us that feeling that we are not alone. I know that sometimes we feel cut off from the light of these enlightened ones, or at least the very least we feel distanced <coughs> from them because this is a planet where we see a lot of pain and suffering. Many people ask themselves, and we even discuss these things sometimes over dinner or during our family time and ask, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world today? Where is God? You know, where is the hierarchy? Why are these things happening to humanity? But they are there. We just have to keep our contact with them. So this verse is to remind us that the Great Ones are with us and that we are not alone. The verse said, learn to comprehend the manifestation of the teaching as a miracle. Many people believe that the writings in the Bible are a miracle, but it does not stop there. The teaching spreads everywhere like a great miracle. If we read the history of philosophy and religion, we see the miracle of how ideas began forming. We can translate the miracles of the teachings by saying that whenever a person enters into the teaching as a whole, as wisdom, light, love, and truth, that person is going to see that some kind of miracle is occurring in his or her life. 
perhaps you can recognize yourself in this experience. I've seen so many people who are following a wasted or lazy path in their life or following a dark path of drugs. Those using drugs day and night but who after reading and began following the instructions and the beauty and the joy and the teaching, their lives suddenly changed. They became beautiful human beings. I've seen people who are disappointed in life, questioning their own life in general, or were depressed by what they saw going on in the world, the wars and famine and killings and mistrust and so forth. But when the teachings entered their home, it changed things for them. But of course they had to first absorb the teaching for this to happen. When you see the stars and the beauties of the night sky, you know that a great law is running the whole show. Such a law must be grasped intuitively within us. Intuitive means ideas that we understand through our heart, not through our intellect, not through our education. It's just something we know and in this knowingness comes a bright light, like a beam of light, rays of light, and through this beam or rays of light, there are seeds of love and beauty and optimism and inspiration, uh, enthusiasm and energy field that fills us up. And that's what intuition is. It's not going to um, a therapist. It is not going to uh, the number one best-selling book in the New York Times. It is something that comes from inside. So this is a law that must be grasped intuitively within us. This is how we come to acknowledge the spiritual hierarchy. It's like when I first heard about the hierarchy, I read a book uh, called The Eyes of Hierarchy uh, and also another book called The Plan, both about the hierarchy many, many years ago. And I knew it to be true. I knew it to be fact. Uh, I didn't learn anything about the hierarchy <clears throat> or that they were watching us in school. I knew my teacher was always watching me <laughs> with that ruler. <laughs> but I, I just knew intuitively that it's real. This is fact. This is reality. So it's not something that anybody can take away from us. That once we intuitively acknowledge and understand the spiritual hierarchy. Once we intuitively grasp these things, then we must make a great endeavor to live the rhythm of this law. This is, in fact, the secret of temple dances. For example, when 20 people hold hands together, this is a symbolizing of creation. The music is a teaching. Music is a teaching. The teaching is music. People must slowly enter into the rhythm, the music, the dance of the teaching in order to, to be harmonious with the laws of nature. And the laws of nature is the teaching. This is the miracle. The verse, another part of the verse says, in order to manifest the shield, the teaching on all paths of your life, the master says, I feel each moment 
that is useful to you. So what is the shield? How do we construct it? By living the teaching. By living the teaching, we build a shield that protects us with the best within ourselves and within every other human being. Why do we need protection? Well, we have enemies. We need a shield to protect us from these enemies. These enemies are destructive forces on earth. We must build a shield against them. <clears throat> For example, hatred. Hatred is an enemy. Fear is an enemy. Anger, treason, bullying. These are all enemies. Slander. Slander is an enemy. But if we hold the teaching, the shield, against all of these enemies, enemies we protect ourselves. We need to protect ourselves so that the light that is starting to flow through us has a chance and the freedom to spread itself. Another sentence in the verse says, learn to comprehend the manifestation of the teaching as a miracle in order to manifest the shield on all paths. Learn to do this in the way you think, in the way you live, the way you act in your business, your family life, your group life, and the way you act in society. Try to manifest the shield, the teaching, everywhere because the enemy is waiting for us everywhere. St. Paul said, the enemy is within you, like a tiger, ready to devour you. You must feel that there is an enemy. Maybe it is your thoughts. Maybe it is through gossip and slander and malice, or even the malice of others. The Master says, I feel each moment that is useful for you. So I was thinking about this and, and uh, when I put this, I put this talk together a couple of weeks ago and it gave me a chance to really think more about what does this mean when the Master says, I feel each moment that is useful for you. The great teacher is telling us here that each moment of importance for us is felt in his heart. Each important moment, not when we're watching TV, you know, not when we're at the grocery store counting out our pennies these days. But most spiritual moments of importance. These spiritual moments typically are not filled with love, even though what I found is love is the impetus to these difficult, challenging, or opportunities of potential. So it was like the other day, I was going through some trauma uh, with my puppy dog, and things just weren't going right for me and they weren't going right for the dog and uh, I was just traumatized trying to know what to do to save his life, her life, sorry, Max. And uh, I had, you know, this is not going anywhere and I sat down and studied the teaching, got some inspiration, decided to write another lecture <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't but, <clears throat> maybe 30 minutes uh, into that experience that I calmed down. And in calming down, the trauma was removed. I knew what to do and the answers were there. And I couldn't help but think then at the time, what if I didn't have these teachings? You know, this source of inspiration to live my life by. 
So the great teacher is telling us here that each moment of importance for us is felt in the teacher's heart. A moment of success, a moment of pain or suffering, a moment of beauty, a moment of engaging in a sacrificial service, or being engaged in the plan for humanity. Great ones feel it when we are doing something good in our thinking, feeling, and action. It is like a mother who knows her heart, how her, in her heart, how her child is doing, feeling, and thinking. And a father too. Not all fathers have that sensitive heart, but the fathers that do. What I have found with fathers that have a good heart are fathers of strength and daring and humility. Strength, daring, and humility. Those three elements open their heart and make them as sensitive as the nurturing quality of a mother's heart. It's so beautiful to see. So let's say, let's take both of the mother and the father's heart the father who has heart can see something great and feel something great and beautiful being accomplished in the actions of their child. It is just like that except this time it is for all God's children. If we can just recognize that we are being watched uh, and then we can ask ourselves, you know, as we go through our day, is this something we want the Great One to watch? Is what I'm saying, what I'm feeling, what I'm doing, actions worthy of their attention? It's interesting to pause yourself and to ask yourself a question like that. Christ said, if you give one cup of water to a thirsty man or woman, this will not be forgotten. So, not to make this too personal, but it was such a beautiful story when I took Maggie to the vet, uh, ready to put her down, and uh, she's still with us, by the way, uh, but drove to the vet, you know, just knowing this is the right thing for both of us, and walking in there, and a few tears going down, and, and this woman came up to me, uh, she had a cat that was not well. She, it just radiated love from her and started talking about how the vets are keeping her cat alive and how wonderful they were. And she said, you're going to have trust in them and just know your pet's going to be well cared for. And, and I thought, this is an angel coming in here where I'm coming in. Okay, put the dog down. You know? <laughs> and here she is so heart oriented. And uh, she gave me this cup of water, you know, when I was so thirsty and in need. And, and the whole staff was like that. They were so beautiful. And so for me, that was a real important moment, a moment of perhaps a little miracle. Good deeds will be registered in your bank account. Every moment when you do something good, they feel it. It is such a great comfort for us because even if mom or dad didn't acknowledge, acknowledge our achievements, they do. They feel it. They see. We rejoice when we feel that they see what we are doing. If we do something good for our spouse, our children and friends, if we find and repair a broken heart, if we see the life, save the life of a dying friend or pet, or one who's taking a step toward death and pull him out and save him, all good deeds like these are not forgotten. The verse says, our front line stands as a wall. The front line comprises of 
aspirants and disciples, initiates and great ones who stand between humanity and the dark forces to protect humanity like a wall. The front line always confronts danger. If we did not have the teaching, we as a humanity would still be in a horrible state. The front line takes the enemy's arrows and stands to protect the children so that they can grow and eventually find their way. The world's most difficult, dangerous places are those where disciples and initiates are working in very hard conditions. Conditions of pain and suffering, slander and hatred. But regardless, they try to do their job because their job is to protect humanity. It's like the teaching, the job of the teaching, the job of those who gave us the teaching is to protect humanity and to lead humanity home. For example, I know a group of disciples who go down into the hood of Houston each week to awaken those who are lost and broken. Now, when I first heard about, heard about the hood of Houston, I had no idea what the hood was. I mean, I had, you know, an under, intuitive understanding, but I didn't have facts and specifics. And so I asked Mr. Google to tell me more about the hood of Houston. And oh my gosh, it's like, it's like the bowels of the earth it is so dark and so dank and filled with criminals and homeless people and dying people. It's, it's a horrible place to be. You know, it's not a place that most of us would consciously choose to go in and to try to save any of them. But this group of disciples did for a long time at great expense. So what dangers and arrows are such heroes facing? We're facing the dark forces. It's very real. Not everybody will agree with that, even though they see it, even though they see the darkness, the evil taking place in the world, they blind themselves and say it's not real. But the heroes recognize it and are here to protect humanity. Each hateful thought, we are told, goes from our minds and then accumulates and builds a cloud of darkness in space, preventing the sun from entering our sphere. This is called special karma, S-P-A-T-I-A-L. Special karma is when the accumulation of hatred builds to such a degree that it then, like a magnet, pulls those whose hearts are filled with hatred and anger and malice and revenge, draws them all together, uh, congregates them all together, not just physically on the earth plane, but those in the astral world mm -hmm. as well. And this is called special karma. Our heroes, our aspirants, our disciples, our initiates, then fight this darkness. Hero stands against these things. They insulate and isolate the darkness and encapsulate them so that we always have communion with God. See, and that's the other, that's the other concerning point is that the darkness will disconnect us from God, from these great beings, from hierarchy. And so we have heroes 
we have the masters that are walking the planet today radiating their light which ignites the light that is within us that eventually finds us all fighting against and being successful in eradicating darkness. The verse says, what is a flashing smile? It said, and the smile flashes at lightning over all faces of each of your successful moves. A flashing smile gives us energy to do something dangerous or to forgive an enemy. Sometimes when a person is cantankerous with you and they're out of sorts and they make a condemning remark to you, a human being's immediate instinct is to fight right back. But if you have the, the light within, the beauty, the love within, it can control that instantaneous reaction and instead just say I understand and I'm sorry. You will 99% of the time you will see that person melt because they've been touched by this love. It's so beautiful. A flashing smile is a way to forgive an enemy. A smile is not for satisfaction only. It is also a device to release energy to encourage a person. The verse says, so we watch the movements of the chosen hands. Who are the chosen hands? The movements of the chosen hands. Who are the chosen hands? They are those individuals who chose themselves to work in the garden. They developed the science of gardening, the science of teaching, the science of explaining the teaching. Their hands are always working. As an individual, you can be a chosen hand because God can work through you. You could say, you are the hand of God. You are chosen if you dedicate yourself to the transformation of human being. It's like a, a young man told me about Maggie. I learned so much about this this week. And he said, why are you keeping her alive? I said, because she is a spark of light and life is a gift. And so whether it is an animal or a human being, we do everything possible to help prevent that little animal or that beautiful human being from suffering and try to pull them, those who are tr thinking about taking their lives, we do everything we can to help protect them and to help them respect this great life that they have been given. So life is special, even if it is a pet. We are chosen as a hand of God if we dedicate ourselves to the transformation of human beings. When you are the chosen hands, you are under the watchful eyes of the great ones. They watch how you do things with your hands. A nation can be a hand of God. A group can be a hand of God. A, one of the sentences in the verse said, joyous is each resourcefulness because the shield is forged on both sides. Mm -hmm. Humanity is on one side and great servers, members of hierarchy, are on the other. Great servers worked on their side to forge the shield of protection. And we work as members of humanity on this side to build the shield. Resourcefulness is the ability to work in such a way 
that your plans are successful. You must be intelligent and intuitive. You find ways and means to make your divine plans work out. This is resourcefulness, which causes joy. In the verse it said, by the broadness of your vision, will you allot your own part? So this is an instruction for you, for you specifically. The broadness of your vision, what does this mean? Do you know how, are you a visionary? If you are a vision, if visionary, if you have a vision, how broad is that vision? In that vision, you will find your field of service if you have greater and greater vision. Vision in this instance means seeing the complexity and wholeness of the service field and then finding the parts in which you can work. We all have different talents in varying degrees, abilities, and dimensions. When our vision expands, then we see exactly where we fit and what we can do in that special service. So vision is the intuitive perception of our life purpose as it relates to the future. It is a sense of sight on the mental plane. The broadness of our vision depends on the foldment of our unfoldment of our consciousness. In other words, it is the development of our perception and seeing. The degree of unfoldment of our vision is the measure of our achievement. The verse said, by the broadness of our vision, will you allot your own part? Broadness is the distance you can see. Broadness is the distance that you can see. How far can you see? It is the range of your vision. So for example, when White Mountain Education Association was established uh, 41 years ago. We're going to be celebrating our 41st anniversary in a couple of weeks. The vision was there. The seed of the vision was there. The nucleus of the vision was there. But as the consciousness of the group members unfolded and began to expand, more and more of that vision began to manifest and unfold. So even though the, the prototype was planted as a nucleus in the vision, the whole of the vision was not necessarily seen in the details in the very beginning. We had to broaden our vision. And to the degree that the vision, our consciousness was broadened is the degree that that vision continues to unfold. It is the unfolding of the vision that the members of hierarchy watch and support and gives us inspiration to continue. The hierarchy is the living headquarters of a world educational group here and in the higher worlds. So let me close with this. The planetary hierarchy is a head called the hierarch. The hierarch is the nucleus, the king. He is holy. He is one who sublimated himself, transformed himself, and penetrated the depth of the principles and laws 
of the universe. Agni Yoga is given to us by one of the great masters of the hierarchy, by two of his closest disciples, Helena and Nicholas Rourke. They have brought the manifestation of the brilliance and knowledge of the hierarchy into existence. As you read, especially the first two books of Agni Yoga, The Call and Illumination, alongside that last book that was finally published, Super Mundane, it's actually four books, but if you go to the internet, to the agniyoga.org site, they made it into one. So it depends on where you're reading, whether you're reading Super Mundane from agniyoga.org or from the books that we have in print. Uh, the books we have in print are three books and they combine three and four together. Interesting, <clears throat> interesting history. Anyway, in these first two books, The Call and Elimination, and especially in Super Mundane, you're going to see the invisible visible and you're going to see the unmanifest manifested. The manifestation of unprecedented possibilities is behind the door, says Master M. Give us reason to rejoice. <laughs>